feel so powerful. I walk up front and the room gets quiet. We've all been very well taught appropriate social behavior. Um, welcome, my name is Dr. Frank Connor. I'm the chair of the psychology department. This is the fourth and last presentation in this year's psychology department speaker series. I am so happy to introduce to you um, Dr. Eddie O'Connor. Dr. Connor is a sports psychologist at Mary Free Bread. Mary Free Bed. Well, that, it's not an animal psychologist, although we did have a presentation by an animal psychologist one time a few years ago. Um, Dr. O'Connor is a fellow and certified consultant with the Association for Applied Sports Psychology. His PhD, his doctorate, is from Illinois Institute of Technology in Chicago. His bachelor's degree is from Binghamton. And I would like you to give a warm welcome to Dr. O'Connor. Now I am? All right. Well, I'm very excited to see uh, everybody here. Um, pretty brief introduction, but what I would like to really focus on is what the point is and what I personally hope you guys get out of today. I don't want to just talk at you. Um, what I really hope is that through the conversation we have for the next hour or so, that you get something very, very applied that you can apply to your sport, to school, to your relationships, or whatever area that you want to um, be more mentally tough at. So what the goals are for today is to say, okay, well, what does mental toughness look like? I think everybody recognizes when we see it, but to actually define it can sometimes be a little bit tricky. So what does it look like very specifically? How do you develop it daily and then apply it to your life? And then we'll leave some time for questions at the end. Um, but Honestly, uh, there's going to be lots of practical tips that I go through. So if we're on a certain subject or, or segment or topic that you're going to spend a little bit more time on, we've got a lot of time built in that we could actually do that to make this more of a conversation. Sound good? All right. So the X factor, why did I call it that? Um, well, let me ask you a couple of questions. When I say your game, if you're an athlete, respond to that. If you're a professor, think about your professional game. If, if there's any area of life that's important to you, what percentage of that game is mental? And I will call on people. I won't pick on the people in the front row because you're brave enough to sit here. But <laughs> did you hear the cheer? What percentage of your game is mental? 90. 97? <laughs> Oh, 90. We got agreement there. This side of the room, you got game? 90? <laughs> 100. All right, you know, I get a lot of, the, the worst I've ever heard is 50%. Um, 90 actually tends to be, for whatever reason, very popular. Um, and some people do say 100. Um, and that's, yeah, it's interesting. I, I actually think it's 100% physical and 100%. Uh, emotional. We'll get into that in a little bit and we'll see why, because I don't think we go and do anything without thoughts and emotions. Um, but more specifically, I'd like to know how much time do you spend developing the mental game? Again, if we have some athletes here, you know, take that model. Spend a lot of hours practicing. The athletes that I work with at Mary Freebed, um, anywhere from two hours a day to some gymnasts, 16, 18 hours a week in physical practice. How much time do you spend in mental training? Studying in school doesn't count. Very common response. Never thought about it. Anybody else? <laughs> Not enough. That's a good answer, too, which is probably why you're all here. Um, but I do find it very interesting. In the athletes that I talk to, we get these numbers. Well, not really. Why do we do that? Well, I think, again, because we're constantly swimming our, through our thoughts and our emotions. We've always had them. Um, there's a little bit of a stereotype against, oh, you know, if you have to work on your mindset, you know, maybe you're not, you're, that you're weak of some kind. But I was fascinated to find out that I didn't know sports psychology existed until I was a uh, senior. It was the last class I took in college. I already knew I wanted to be a psychologist. I take this class, and I'm like, oh, my gosh, I mean, there's something I could have done to fix all of this stuff. My career was over by that time. I was really disappointed. But to actually find out that there is actually a way to think and to feel that can enhance your performance and skills that you can use to build it. But most people don't. We don't think about it, and we certainly don't prioritize it. I know, again, as an ap applied sports psychologist, sometimes I'm competing for time with certainly more coaching. I'm competing with golf clubs, competing with extra lessons, sometimes competing with nutritionists and other things about where do we put it in. But we always have our thoughts and feelings with us. 
So let me ask you, because again, some people know mentally tough people. Is this something just something that you're born with, or can you develop it? Yeah, I hope we can develop it, because otherwise we're going to sit here and waste time for an hour, right? Okay, we can absolutely develop it. So here's one of my favorite definitions of um, mental toughness. It's having the natural, because some people are kind of wired this way, or developed psychological edge that lets you be more consistent and better than your opponents in remaining determined, focused, confident, and in control under pressure. So to break this down a little bit, when I, when I think about mental toughness, I look at those two components of, of mental, of being consistent, more consistent, and being better than your opponents. More consistent because you're not either just mentally tough or not. I remember working with a, uh, a professional football team, and uh, I'm trying to talk to them. Like Some of the coaches were you know, happy to have me there, and some of them really just didn't want me to be there at all. And I'll never forget the, the defensive coordinator was like, Doc, this is the pros now, man. These are football players. They're already mentally tough. And it was kind of hard to stand up to him and say, <laughs> well, you know, I was like, yeah, they're all big, strong, and fast, too. But you, know, you still you work out those things. Um, there's something threatening sometimes about feeling like, well, if I'm not mentally tough, I'm mentally weak. And that's not the case. I mean, we want to look at it as a continuum. And then if you're going to be mentally tough, it's really going to be in relationship to um, you know, the other people. So again, Olympians can be fast. Athletes can be fast. You can be good at your job, but you can always be better. And then it really comes down to when you're under pressure and having to perform, not are you mentally tough or aren't you, but how much more can you use that mental awareness, intensity, focus, concentration, uh, to use that to bring you ahead of your opponent in winning. I think we all know what those things are. We'll go into it in a little bit more detail, but determined, we're going to talk about that, uh, motivation versus commitment, being focused, having to choose your attention, where to put it at the right time, being confident, and I'm actually going to undermine myself a little bit in saying that sometimes I think that can be overplayed, and we'll learn how to deal with it when you don't have confidence. And then my favorite part of all of it is staying in control under pressure. Because how many people here react to their emotions? All right, good, an honest group. I like it. So I always like to start off with the idea of mental toughness, and really anything that you're going to do has to be grounded in what's important to you. So with all, again, the athletes that I work with, it always kind of starts off and I kind of get a nice assessment of, well, well what's, what's your mission? What's the point? I like this definition of, of what do you value? Values provide meaning to your efforts, direction for your energy, and endurance through adversity. It really is sort of the foundation that all your mental toughness is going to be built upon. So let's make this a little bit more personal. Let me ask some people if you're willing to share, and if you're not, I'd, I'd at least like you to ask yourself the question and say, why did you come here today? <laughs> I was told that that was actually <laughs> part of the reason. Okay. Uh, again, honesty, I like that. If I could offer you something more, um, as, you, as you listen, even if you don't know, but I, I'd like you to choose an area of your life that you'd like to be better at. Again, you don't have to shout it out, but I do ask everybody to, to get the most out of this, to think about one area where you'd like to be more mentally tough. Okay? Everybody got one? Now I'd like to do this other exercise. It's an intervention that I do with my athletes often early on. I'd like you all to close your eyes. I'm going to do a bit of imagery. And what I'd like you to imagine is yourself. If you're an athlete, for example, and you want to be better in your sport, I'd like you to imagine the end of the season banquet. If uh, you're a student and you're really thinking, well, I want to be a better student, maybe it's going to be at graduation, or maybe it's even further down the line at the end of your career. If it's uh, a relationship that you want to improve on, social skills, um, or any other area, maybe you're actually looking at, uh, I've done this with some people, your funeral and the very end when everything is said and done. So I'd like you to kind of keep some time off in the future and start to imagine that all these people have gathered. Let's go with the retirement dinner idea. That all your teammates, your coaches, parents, friends, family, opponents, everybody's gathered to celebrate your career. And there's one particular person that knows you extremely well through it all that goes up to the podium and is going to address the group that's gathered to celebrate you and your accomplishments. So I want you to see that person, look around, see everybody who's gathered. And as this person starts to speak, maybe they start off with a few jabs and a few humor and a few funny stories. 
But then they start to get serious about the type of person or athlete or worker or professor that you are. And they start talking about the way you came to work every day. Why don't you just be open to what you hear based on the way that you live, the way things are going. They talk about the attitude that you bring to practice, to class. They talk about your work ethic. If you go the extra mile, or if you cut corners. They talk about the quality of what you do. Your attention to detail, your precision, or half-heartedly, they talk about what people see. They don't know what's in your heart, they only know what you do. So they talk about the behaviors that demonstrated these qualities, season after season, semester after semester year after year, but you've built up this legacy. They start talking about your relationships on the team or in the classroom or at the workplace, how you treated others. If you were helpful or if you sabotaged, if you were selfish, or giving, if you were team first, the things that you did and the stories that this person would tell that illustrated that. Or if you looked out for number one. And then it starts to get into the hard times when things got rough. How did you react? Through pain and injury, through losses, when you weren't motivated, when you got tired, as all people do, how you responded. How you handled your emotions when things didn't go right when you made a mistake. If you rebounded or if you let that stuff keep you down. The attitude that you brought in the dark days and the dark times. And I'd like you to kind of now observe and pay attention to what you heard this person say. And if you liked what this person had to say about you, great. I encourage you to keep doing that and maybe apply some of the things that we learned. But as you still sit there with your eyes closed, I want you to think that if you didn't like the things that you heard, that if you kept doing things the way that you're doing them, this is the way things are going to go. And so just let yourself think about, well, what do I want to be different? Because the great news is, is that this is some point off in the future. And our legacies are built one day at a time with the choices that we make. And you have time to make those choices. So again, let yourself focus on something that you'd like to get out of today something that you can apply it to that has great meaning to you. And when you're ready to come back into the room, just slowly open your eyes and take a stretch.
and if the person next to you still has their eyes closed, give them another minute and then just nudge them for me. So again, this is a personal exercise I like to do with my athletes as a, a practical way to kind of get them grounded. You don't have to say anything, but I encourage anybody if you have any feedback or questions about the experience. Careful with moving your hair, I might jump right on that. <laughs> He had said it's a meditative thing. Yeah, absolutely. And a lot of what mental toughness, I think, comes down to, and we'll be talking about this, is, again, being observant of yourself and make is, making conscious choices. This is not natural by any stretch, and it's, everything starts with awareness. Any other reactions? Okay. So what i like to do now for the next bit here is go into my favorite mental toughness tips. And this is the one that I love to start off with, get you really – at the beginning, because I, I think of all of them, uh, you know, I'll say this about each one. Each one's most important, but this one's really good. Um, and I think it's so common where my athletes tend to, you know, get mixed up a little bit. But I like to, to start off and say, play for excellence or work for excellence. And, and this idea of excellence is to play to your own standard of excellence, not up or down to the level of your opponent. So much of what I see is people coming in, they just want to win. They're focused on the outcome. And how many people can control if they win or lose? One person? So you win all the time then? No. Um, do you choose to lose then? Do you really control that? No. <laughs> and it, what's that? You have a choice? To participate or not, absolutely. And that actually, the idea of choice is exactly what I want to hit on, is because so many times we get caught up in I want the raise, or I want this outcome, or, or I want to win or lose. But we cannot control that. And again, I, I think of this same coach that didn't want me to, you know, as part of this team, would just yell at the players to, you know, come on, we got to win or stop this drive and you, all these outcomes. How many people have had coaches that just say, you know, make the shot, score the points? You hear all of this, right? And I'm sitting there like, how? Like, what, what can you possibly, don't you think that's what we're trying to do? Do we need coaches to tell us this? <laughs> you know, come on, win. Oh, is that why I'm here? <laughs> But, you know, again, it's, it's, we get so focused on the outcome, and it just screws athletes up. It screws all of us up when we get so, because we can't control the outcome of this. But what we can control, just like you had said, is what choices do we make, the process of it. So if we get all screwed up kind of thinking about, you know, what I love about this picture is look at how serious these two are. All right, now, if you're going to sumo wrestle according to expectations, who's going to win this? We think the big guy is, right? And probably 999 times out of 1,000, he will. But look at the way the two of them are. I mean, you see the parents in the back, they're laughing. They think it's funny. But these two athletes don't. What I love about this is they both look like they're going to play for excellence, which basically means, you know what, I have a performance to do. My job is to execute my skills, be technically sound, play with high intensity, all the things that we're going to talk about. And once you let go of the outcome and you say, I'm going to control the process of it, and I'm going to be the most excellent that I can be. I'm going to, I'm going to play as well as I can. A whole lot of pressure goes away because you're in control of that. I don't know if we have football fans here. I'm a, honestly, I'm a, I'm, a, I'm a Bills fan, so this hurts me to tell this story. But you remember a number of years ago when the Patriots were going crazy and they were just you know, running up the score and everybody's talking about the Patriots? They were like, you remember this, right? I was a Bills fan. I mean, they were beating us by like 40-something points, and they had like fourth and one on the one-yard line through a touchdown pass to Randy Moss. I'm like crying. I'm like, but I had to respect what Bill Belichick was doing that season. He was like, I don't care what the outcome is. Kept Brady in, you know, up by 50 points and kept him in. He wasn't coaching to anything other than execute the play the way we designed it. Forget about everything else. Forget the score. Forget the risk of injury. They did that throughout the whole season. I thought it was amazing. It's the, one of the few times I've truly seen this be completely done, only focusing on the process. Only be the best player you can be. Execute exactly the way we designed it. That's the only thing we care about. And that's what these guys are doing. So you might think, if you're the big guy, you might kind of think what? If you were going to play to the level of your opponent, how do you think he's going to play? What do you think his intensity level is going to be? He'll be confident. Uh, I might even take it further and say overconfident, right? This is what I love about the NCAA tournaments. Why don't we have four number one seeds in the final four? We almost never get four number one seeds. Right? Because upsets happen. Overconfidence is a big part of that. So this guy, if you're overconfident, how do you end up playing? Weaker. You're sloppy, maybe slapping the kid, you know, 
just you know, you know, not paying attention, his intensity goes down, his, his concentration goes down, his focus goes down. And what he does, by not being the best athlete he can be, is he opens up a window. Now, again, kid's gonna need a lot of things to go wrong <laughs> in order for this guy to win, but you start thinking about it in your areas of performance. If you're overconfident against somebody of a relatively similar ability, these are how upsets happen. You've, you've all seen them. So now this other little kid, now he's, again, if he's gonna think that he's gonna get killed, what do you think his attitude might be and how might he play? Weaker, he'll protect. How many people here, like if you know you're gonna fail, how many people give full effort? Even when we think we're gonna win, full effort, and I'm talking full effort. We so rarely do that. It is incredibly hard. We're not wired to work really, really hard. Um, so do me a favor, I wanna try something. Um, everybody, reach as high as you can in the air. Now reach higher. Okay, for the, now reach higher. I only saw one person do it and then you stop be giving me 100%, lady in the orange in the back. <laughs> Thank you, some people stood up. Stand up, I'm not done, come on. <laughs> because I still don't think I have your best. Now reach higher. Good, I get some people who are now standing on some chairs. Now, for liability reasons, don't do that. I'm not done. Reach higher. <laughs> Good, thinking outside the box, going to the second floor, he said, but I don't see anybody jumping. So, oh, is that right? Okay, all right, you can have a seat. But you see what I'm saying? I mean, like, how many times, I mean, now, Grant, why are you gonna listen to me? But how many times do I have to ask to say, give me 100%, give me 100%? We're not wired to do it. And everybody, how many people, first time you lifted, thought that's as high as I can go? Right? Some people were, okay, a lot of people were knowingly just saying, well, I'll just entertain them. But again, more and more and more. Barriers to it. Oh, it's socially awkward. I don't want to fall and break my neck. Lots of reasons that will prevent us from doing it. Love the coaches that say, I want 110%. All right, first, besides that being mathematically impossible, it drives me insane. Because I'm like, what are you expecting from, especially these eight, nine-year-olds that we're coaching? <laughs> But really, we, can't, we, don't, we don't do that. I want to respect how hard it is to truly do this, to play to a level of excellence. And what my next part is, I think, if I'm on target here, is to give a career best effort every time you're, you're performing. It's going to take a lot of mental energy. But this is where you want all of your attention to go. And again, the quality of what you do. That's what I'm talking about, the excellence. It's not just showing up to practice, but some of the things that we had talked about in this retirement dinner here you know, the idea of how do you do this? How do you approach your sport? More than just showing up, but what do you want to be every day? Mental toughness is that. What does that look like in the sense of intensity and commitment? Some other things that we'll get into. I love playing to your own standard of excellence because once you start to identify the kind of athlete you want to be, the kind of person you want to be, the partner you want to be, the worker you want to be, the professor you want to be, once you get that image of what that, stand, that excellent standard is, that's a lot to live up to. And put your energy and attention into that that has value and has meaning. And that's going to be your foundation. Do we have any perfectionists in the room? Okay, good. I want to talk about the perfect perfectionist because I get a lot of that at Mary Freebed with the athletes coming in. And it's actually something that I actually I really admire. I wish more people were perfectionists. Uh, you get a lot of stuff where people do a, a job halfway and it, it can be very frustrating. But it's also something that burns out a lot of my athletes, and, and it can really be difficult. So we all want to be perfect for a lot of reasons, or a lot of us do. And that usually has an attitude that I see of never making a mistake. Mistakes are failures. They are unacceptable. And again, the perfectionists in the room, I can't see with the light if, if people are nodding, but we beat ourselves up. And it's like we get so frustrated when we make a mistake. It's... Oh, I mean, you just get this visceral reaction when, when things go wrong because we want to be perfect. We want to be the best, and that's what it takes to win, and we've got to be perfect. Anybody achieve it? Okay. Now, again, that doesn't make us feel any better, though, does it? To say, oh, nobody's perfect. How many people have heard that? How many people feel good about that? Yeah, I mean, it has never, hasn't helped me. I had, to, I had to find this way. So what ends up happening when you're perfectionistic is you get angry. It's unacceptable, and you're hard on yourself. Again. People beat yourself up when things go wrong, are perfectionists. If you're human beings, I know you do this. What it leaves you with is, is burnout. A lot of my athletes will end up getting out of the sport or you'll get burned out in your life 
if you keep striving for something that you can't achieve. So let's talk about striving for excellence. Because there's still, I think, the target of perfection. Again, I like that idea. And you're really not going to win gold or be the best you can be if you're not really striving for perfection. But you've got to understand it and relate to it differently. Before I bring up some other things under here, what do you think is the key to switching from perfectionism to excellence? What do you think is the one difference in the two things? Mistakes. Who is, who, 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 who? What, what about mistakes? It's exactly right. To let yourself make them. It's exactly it. It's an attitude that mistakes are an opportunity to learn. That's the only difference. Because again, people are like, well, I can't, if I'm not perfectionistic, I won't do as well. I had one guy who was, uh, came in and he was, um, had this just millionaire, had very expen you know, made a lot of money doing things. And he's like, look, if you're going to teach me to relax, he's like, you're going to cost me millions. <laughs> and I'm like, no, no, no. I'm just saying, you know, he's had terrible headaches and stress because of this. I'm like, I'm just going to tweak it so you can actually be better. This isn't about saying, oh, you know, I made a mistake, so what? Who cares? You do care, but you understand what mistakes actually are. So a couple of life experiences to tell you how important this is. Anybody have kids in here? Okay, anybody was ever a kid? All right, so you can all relate. Kid one year old or so. Is this how parents do it? Okay, it's time to walk, Junior. So come on, let's go. You've been watching me for a year. Let's go. One foot in front of the other. It, you know, do you yell it? Come on, come on. We've fallen again. What are you doing? Right, but this is youth sport. <laughs> right, do you, do, you, do you show the kid a video, put on like Einstein? What is that, young Einstein? Here's a video of how to walk. Do we teach him that way? How does this kid lose, learn to walk? Crawls and then falls. How many times do they fall? How many mistakes should they make? Three, four? Thousands. And that's okay. We, we, we tolerate that. But you take that same one-year-old, and then you put him in a t-ball at, at four, all of a sudden mistakes aren't okay anymore, right? right? You've all seen this. Maybe we've been that parent. I have sometimes. It's like you, you, something changes when we put on a helmet. <laughs> but all of a sudden, I, I, and I'll tell you, my, when my son was six, great backyard story. We're throwing the ball back and forth, one of his first times playing. I'm loving it. Beautiful day. Picture perfect. I screw it up because, of course, he's doing well, so I got to up it, right? Couldn't just play catch. So I start throwing it higher, throwing it to the left and the right so he can start developing his skills because, you know, at six years old, he needs to develop his skills. And so he starts missing it. So right away, he doesn't like mistakes. He starts getting sad. So then, like, all effort goes out the window, right, because when we're not motivated, he starts throwing it like this. It's going over my head. I'm getting ticked off. I'm like, come on, you know. And what do I tell him? I'm like, it's OK to make a mistake. In my head, I'm thinking, you know, there's a long, long time before you go to Major League Baseball. <laughs> but he's not buying it already. And he's, like I said, he's throwing it over my head. He's not even reaching his glove out. And I had to stop everything and slow down. And I was like, buddy, I'm like, it's OK to make a mistake. And he's like, oh. and I'm like, all right, this, what's the, you're not getting? I had to actually get down on one knee cup his face and tell him, I want you to make a mistake. And he got a little eye roll. And I'm like, if you don't make a mistake, that's when you're going to disappoint me. And that got his attention. So now he's listening. And the way I explained it to him was like, if you're not making a mistake, bud, you're not trying. And in my head, I'm thinking, if you think you know everything about baseball at six years old, you know, there's a lot to learn. But they don't understand all those explanations. He wanted to impress, and he wanted to, he, he already knew at this point, which is a separate story, about how it wasn't okay. And I was like, if you're not making mistakes, you're not trying. You're not giving effort. I was like, I want you to challenge yourself. I expect you to make a mistake every day, at least one. Now, don't make the same mistake, because then we're going to have an issue. Then it's laziness, or, you know, I want you to learn from it. But I challenge all of you, too. Make a mistake every day. Make a different mistake every day. There's billions to choose from. <laughs> really, plenty of variety. But, you know, OK, oh, OK, did that, learn from it, pick up a new one. But if you keep picking up the same one, again, that's, that's what I'm talking about is a problem. Worked with an international skier, um, downhill skier, who hadn't been reaching her potential and tried all the typical mental toughness stuff that we're actually going to go through. But the thing that actually worked for her was that I told her, you have to fall on your runs down the mountain more often. I was like, so I want you to make more mistakes. And I was very nervous about recommending this. <laughs> I was like, don't turn into trees on purpose or do anything. 
But she was going here. Her coach said her potential was here, and she wasn't getting past it because she wasn't willing to make a mistake. But she didn't know where her limit was. So we actually had a homework assignment where she had to push herself and go a little bit faster so that she fell on like one out of every four runs. That's what broke her through, her willingness to take mistakes to be able to learn from them. So where do we get this idea that mistakes are not okay? Like students were born practically, but again, going back to my son who two years prior to this fiasco in my backyard was playing youth soccer. So again, anybody been to a, like a little kid soccer game or remember when you had played? So we practice and we're playing in the backyard, teach him, I'm a great sports psychologist, I, I gr grow him up right. Teach him, when he scores, it's not a big deal, it's all about the process and just walk away. So he happens to get lucky and his friend passing the ball, he kicked it and he scores the first goal of the season. Well, what do I do? Yeah, yeah, and I reinforce you, yeah, that's my boy, I'm all proud. He freaks out because the whole team runs up to him, they're patting his head, smacking his butt, he's like, what the heck's going on? And it, it's already starting to change. So they, they start going back to their positions and he leans over to his friend and goes, let's do that again, all right? So the game's going on, I'm all puffy chest and all excited. So they're flying around, big group of kids running around with the ball, and then he goes and he, to kick another one and misses. And so what do all the parents do? Yeah, let's, let's do that loud, let's hear that. Now, I'm a five-year-old, and all the most important people in my world, I have now let them down. And I don't feel good. That's the youth sport experience. He learned. He unlearned everything I'd been teaching him his whole life, five solid years invested in this, and one game, it's all gone. Because I'm acting like a fool, jumping out, celebrating a, a, a score, and then I'm like, oh. And then I smile, oh, it's okay. Bull crab is okay, you know? I'm like, look at what is everybody's reaction. That's not real. We learn from the beginning, from the moment we're born, that mistakes are not okay. And it's unhealthy and it's unfortunate. But if you're gonna be mentally tough, if you're gonna be successful, you have to really adopt the idea that mistakes, because you're going to use it as a learning process, that's, that's where it's going to be at. I went on like six tangents, so we may not have any questions, but <laughs> feeling me? All right. Um, gradual result of always wanting to do better. This is the attitude that's necessary and needed. And then you end up being hungry, optimistic, confident. All this stuff sort of naturally comes through. Once you're allowed to make a mistake, once you, don't, you get rid of this outcome of having to be perfect, which you're never going to be, excellence is really a, a very good. It's very close to perfection with a whole lot of better side effects than the alternative. So I encourage you to work on that. Any questions from the perfectionist before I move on to point two? All right. So after a mistake, this is actually a picture of my son. I don't know if you can see it. His eyes are actually closed. I couldn't believe I was able to capture this. But a very practical way to deal with mistakes is what I call the 4F technique. I actually got it from a, a guy I trained under, um, Dan Kirschenbaum. He came up with this. Fudge. It doesn't mean go get a snack. But basically, when you make a mistake, it's understandable you're gonna have an emotional reaction to it. So allow yourself two to three seconds and internally get mad. So, ooh, fudge, or whatever else you wanna say. <laughs> we'll move on. <laughs> And then fix it, use imagery, find some way to say, well, what, what did I go wrong? Remember I told you, mistakes are an opportunity to learn. So if you can take a break in the action, a lot of times like in baseball, this is really easy, or, or tennis or something like that, you get a moment, you're like, okay, what did I do wrong? Didn't I hustle? Was it the position of my racket? Did I take my eye off the ball? Was I distracted? But whatever it is, imagine yourself going through it again. You know, so if, again, if you're in golf, imagine taking the swing and feel the way you would have wanted it to go. But let yourself get upset, fix it, and then forget about it, which is really hard to do, but I find that when my athletes are able to fix it, it leaves them something else to hold on to. You don't do, you, it's hard to forget something, because, well, for example, let me give you five seconds. Don't think about chocolate, go. All right, how'd you do? The science out there tells us when you try to suppress a thought, you just make it go crazy and do a lot more of it. So if you try to forget something, the easiest way to do it is to choose something else as opposed to trying to push something away. So once you have it fixed, you can forget about the mistake itself and then focus on the next play or the next thing that you need to do. Which leads us into the next topic of, okay, well, what is focusing and how do we do that? Well, focus, I like to define, actually I should rename this as refocus. 
because nobody can focus on anything consistently. I mean, if you, get, if you get one second of dedicated focus before your mind wanders off, I think you're doing pretty good. So really focusing is much more of a skill of noticing when you've gone off and bringing yourself back and how, how quickly can you do that and, and how consistently. But it's essentially defined as paying attention to the right thing at the right time. And I don't like when my athletes say that, they, oh, I just lost focus. I'll hear this all the time. Well, I did good, but I just lost focus. I'll fix it the next time. Really, how? Like, if you already know that that just happened, how are you just going to fix it? And it's also, I think it lets us off the hook. Oh, I just lost focus. Well, again, I don't think you did it on purpose. Hold yourself accountable and responsible and start to recognize that you have to develop slowly and consistently, but you can develop the skill of focusing. So it's a choice that you made. You paid attention to something else. Often what we pay attention to are the things that, well, you know, we're, uh, we'll get into this later, but we're kind of wired to be like, okay, um, you know, I had an emotional reaction or somebody ticked me off or it was a bad call by the ref. It was something that's important to me. Um, and that's more of a mindless, impulsive, something grabbed my attention and pulled it away. But we want to hold ourselves accountable and say, where is it that my mind should be dedicated and committed to? And you can only, how many people multitask? Right? So you kind of feel like I'm doing 12 things at once, right? Not really. You're just cycling between 12 things very rapidly if you're able to do that. And that's good and that's a great skill. But we have to understand that at any given moment in time, we can only focus on one thing at a time. Even if it's for a split second at a time, it's still a rapid shift. You can't do multiple things at once. So knowing that, you want to be able to pick and choose your focus. So a couple things when I work with my athletes, again, that I, I, I use with them, is understanding that your best focus is when your thoughts, feelings, and actions are specific, important to the task, and under your control. A nice way that I like to look at this, too, is, is describe it as a circle of concern and the circle of control and then the irrelevant. Circle of concern is going to be basically most things that my athletes get distracted by. Field conditions, parents in the stands, or at work. It's like, you know, what are our colleagues going to think? Or what's the outcome of the test going to be? Any number of things that it's important to either winning or to the outcome that we want, and it's relevant. And it's maybe something that at another time, at halftime, you want to think about the strategy or you, know, you want to be aware of the weather um, in order to pick the right cleats. So there are the right time to be in that circle of concern. But in the moment of performing, you want to be in the circle of control, which is behaviors, what you choose to do with your body. And I, would, I used to say your thoughts and your emotions too, but how many people can control their thoughts and emotions? I've tried, I've tried to teach it, I've tried to do it, I can't do it. But you control your reactions to the thoughts and the emotions that show up. We'll do a little bit more of that in a little bit. And then the irrelevant is sometimes like when you're sitting here and anybody, if you're thinking about math class or what you're doing tonight, that's the irrelevant stuff that sometimes sneaks in too. Don't feel bad about it. Everybody's doing it. Half of you are doing it right now. It happens. Just bring it back. <laughs> Let me walk through this and ask somebody for an example. Somebody pick an area that you want to improve on. Or you want to improve focus on. We want to, want to do this illustration of what goes into each circle. So somebody, where was my career? So your career. I'm talking about like sort of a moment of performance. So as far as your career, are you talking about uh, taking a test? Are you talking about um, your performance in your job at a particular point? I want to get a real specific behavior that you're doing as performing. OK. So if you're involved in an activity, is that what you're saying? OK, so give me, a, give me an example. Where, where are you performing? What are you doing? What is your performance area? Yeah, this may be kind of getting into more goal setting and, and sort of that sense of planning. Um, but for example, I'd be talking about like when I have an athlete come in and they're saying, well, well, when I'm batting. That's the performance area that I, I want to have more focus on. I want to be able to focus on the ball. Um, so something real specific as far as performance. Yes. Perfect. So you are taking the GRE. So let's understand first, let's start with the easy. What's the irrelevant stuff that's going to pop into your head that you want to recognize? That is actually in the circle of concern because it is important for graduate school. No, and this is good. This is the idea of understanding what goes in each category. Because when these thoughts show up, when you recognize that you've lost focus, you want to kind of understand, is it OK to stay here? Because your mind's going to hook you onto these thoughts. 
And you probably spend a lot of time during the GRE wondering, like, you know what, this is hard. I'm not, I'm not going to get a job. I'm going to be homeless. I'm going to live in a box. Like, this is what's going to happen. It happened to me. <laughs> it happens to everybody. And that's the idea of the circle of concern where it's so dangerous because these things are, they really are of concern. So let's stay in that circle then. What are the other things that are likely to show up in the circle of concern when you're taking the GRE? Yeah, oh my gosh, what if questions? What if I fail? What if I have to take it again? I can't afford this. I'm just going to lose another couple of months of studying. I spent so much on the Kaplan course. Yeah, all of these things. What else? People help her out. What, what shows up? When you're taking tests, what shows up in your mind? Yeah, oh, there's expectations. Oh, that's big. Oh, my parents are going to be so disappointed if I fail. My, you know, let my professors down. Their expectations are oh, tremendous. What else? Circle of concern. Yeah. I got to beat my mortal enemy over here. Uh, where am I going to rank in my class? What's the ranking that I need in order to get to the school of choice? Very good. Other things of concern. These are the things that keep you up at night. Probably worried about them weeks ahead of time. Did I study enough? Am I prepared? What about that time that I slept in? Did I didn't do enough of the practice tests? Very good. One more thing, circle of concern. Yes, that's another thing, too. Oh, my God, what if I do get into graduate school? That's a lot of money. Where am I going to get my loans? Um, you know, yeah, the idea of success. The expectations are going to be raised. I work with a lot of athletes or people in general. When they actually succeed, that's almost just as bad because now they've upped the ante and people are going to expect even more. We can never be happy, it seems like. <laughs> if that's another lecture, I'd be happy to come back. Um, so what's the irrelevant stuff now? I'm hungry. Oh, you know, I can't wait for the new Captain America movie to come out. You know, whatever, you know, what am I doing on Saturday? So all of the stuff that really has nothing to do with it. So if that's all the stuff now, what then am I saying you should be concentrating on? What's in the circle of control? Taking the GRE. Well, I hope you study it ahead of time because now you're taking the test. Because then, then technically that's cheating, my friend. <laughs> Let me just check the reference book. <laughs> or what's up my sleeve. <laughs> You're taking the test. What do you want to be focused on? Perfect, yeah. It sounds self-explanatory, but again, we forget this, don't we? Oh, it starts with awareness. What is the question in front of me? What other things will you pay, want to pay attention to? The time, you might want to check in and out to kind of pace yourself. Depending on the time of the test, that could be under circle of concern because if you spend a whole bunch of time worrying about how much time you have left, you're wasting time. But once in a while, at the appropriate time, you might want to check in on that and then go out. Most of it has to do with the question. And the other thing is, how am I handling my anxiety? You're not going to be able to control your nervousness when it shows up, but your reaction to it. Do I just sit there and concentrate on my heartbeat and how I'm sweating and, oh my gosh, you know, I, need, I need some more water? Or am I able to accept that, let it go, and then get back to the question? And then I worry about all these thoughts. I notice it. Can I let them go? And then get back to the question. Because really, of all the things that you're concerned about, what's the only thing that matters? Do you control passing? Circle of control. Label it that for a reason. Go back two slides. Where you choose your focus and the effort you put forward. That sets you up for success. Anything else. Anything else is a distraction. Everything else seems more important. <laughs> We're kind of built weird that way. We're not built to be high performers. But anything that pulls you from your attention to what you're doing at the moment is going to take away from your performance. It doesn't feel that way. But as you start to experience it and look at this, you'll find that that's, in fact, the case. OK, well done. Centering. Again, I'm going to have you all stand up. Very practical tool that I use for my athletes. Again, like I said, anything in the present moment. I'll let all the seats go. If you get distracted and you start kind of jumping to the future or, or going into the past when you're taking the GRE test, when you're at bat, when you're shooting a free throw, it's going to take away. You can, you can only do your best if you're focused on what you're doing at that time. So I, I, and that, that part about forgetting your mistakes, too, this is a technique called centering that I like them to do in that forgetting part, where you're kind of able to get yourself right here, right now. It's almost like wiping the slate clean. Anybody here have a negative thought, then try to make it positive and fight it back and forth? 
I've learned that you, you kind of need to really need a nice transition because you have to let go of one before you can move on to something else. And this has been a great technique. So what I'd like us to do, I'm going to demonstrate it, is uh, put your hand on your belly. This is your diaphragm. So I'd like you, when you take in a deep breath, I'd like you to be filling it up down in there. And we're going to count in for five, hold, and then go out for seven. And when I'm blowing out for seven, I want you to blow it out through your lips so that you can actually hear the breath. We're going to do that twice just to start off. So it's going to look like this. We do it twice because you're going to have to pace yourself. And if you saw, I kind of went in on three and I didn't have enough air. Or I had too much air and I couldn't do it. So we'll do it twice to pace it. In through your nose for five. Out through the mouth slowly for seven. And in, two, three, four, five. Hold, out, two, three, four, five, six, seven. In, two, three, four, five. Hold, out, two, three, four, five, six, seven. How do you feel? Some people I could tell looking at you, you still look tense. So I'm gonna, we're going to do it two more times. What I'd like you to do this time at six and seven, I want you to focus on your shoulders, especially you. <laughs> there you go. <laughs> and when you're breathing out six and seven, you should be running out most of the air. Now don't slump, just your shoulders, and let your shoulders drop. And at the same time, I'm going to add one or two cue words. And by cue words, I mean Sometimes it's calm or relaxed, and maybe that's what you want to do now. But if I'm working with an athlete, it's sort of like, well, what's sort of that attitude or that focus point that you want? Is it, is it like focusing on the ball? Or again, I worked with some defenders, and it was like kill. Like it, you don't have to necessarily relax, but whatever that intensity is that, that you want to get, wherever you want your mindset to be, as you're breathing out, you want to focus on, again, at max two words, short phrase, one or two cue words. And then if you're an athlete, you kind of lower yourself into a ready position, whatever that is. If you're a, a, an infielder for baseball, for example, you get into that. Um, if you're not, you know, if you're a student and you want to do it for that, you don't have to get into ready for the GRE position. Um, so really focus on the five and then five, six, and seven, dropping your shoulders. And as you're exhaling and breathing out, sometimes athletes are thinking about breathing out the negative stuff or the tension. I'd like you to think about that cue word. So everybody have a, a word? Okay. And in, two, three, four, five, hold, out, two, three, four, five, six, seven, in, five, hold, out, shoulders down. Okay, how was that? Okay, you guys can have a seat. A very quick and effective centering technique that helps you move from intensity, chaos, my mind is stuck, I'm out of control emotionally, and then being able to clear the slate, get your body into the present moment. And that's what I love about this, is that everybody notices that your breath, I love the breath, so everybody knows this and we think about it, but the breath is always present. So you can't forget it, you can't lose your lucky rabbit's foot or anything like that, or those magic socks that you, know, you wear for games. Your breath is always there, and it's always right here, right now, and it's always accessible. Yes? Right. Well, I guess more of the question, I'd be like, well, what are you using this for? So I mean, my reaction to you would be, well, it depends on what the problem is. Yeah. Yeah. Um, well, certainly with the breathing, that's going to be one thing that if you're getting tense, you know, throughout the number of numerous mileage, you want to say, well, I want to be dropping my shoulders. So you can be, as you're running, you would be taking some of these breaths to slow it down if you, if you need to change your physiological intensity. As far as the um, focus aspect, there's some techniques that we're going to be getting into later and uh, talking more about of a willingness and commitment that's going to come later in the presentation that would be more applicable to help you in that, for that sport in that situation. Yes, sir.
So the question is, he's like, as he's a jogger and a runner, and as he's starting to get tired, he'll start throwing sh some shadow punches. Is that a, a distraction? I would say probably, um, and that's okay, depending on the reason for training. Um, again, I, we want to match up sort of the intervention that you use for your goal. So sometimes it's okay to distract. Sometimes it's, in fact, necessary to distract, um, especially for a running sport. Um, but it kind of depends on what you want to do. With my athletes, if your goal is to get through it, let's say you're running the riverbank for the first time, and you want to, you know, you're just, you just want to get out through the mileage, distraction can be great. You can't rely on it, though, because at some point the pain is going to make you pay attention. So that's okay. And then you also notice that if you're using distraction, you're taking the intensity away. So if you're, again, more of a recreational runner who just want to finish, that can help you get through. But for my more advanced runners that want speed, I teach them more to lean into the pain and be more willing as opposed to trying to distract from it. So again, it's, it's kind of situation specific. Good questions. Confidence is another big thing that athletes come in with. And what do you think is the, when athletes tell me that they want to be more confident, what do you think is the very first question that I ask them? I'll give you a hint. The answer is kind of already up there. I didn't make this a slide that brought things out later. Yeah, I say, well, well, tell me about your training. Last thing I want to do is get somebody who's wor not working hard and really isn't that good and make them confident so they can go in there and get slaughtered. But that happens all the time. Overconfidence is actually more deadly than, than underconfidence for all the reasons that we talked about at the beginning. But if, if I don't like to think of confidence necessarily as just a mindset or an attitude. I mean, certainly that can be part of it. But there is nothing stronger than knowing that you are fully prepared. So if it's the GRE and you want to be confident about it, you want to so you'll start taking those practice tests. How often are you studying? You know, are you looking at the things that are hard and difficult? Because we tend to shy away from our weaknesses because we don't like to engage them. But are we attacking them? Um, again, whatever your sport is, well, what is your training practice? Do you have confidence in your coaches? What are your weaknesses? How are you developing those? What are your strengths? Do you know what they are and how are you using them? You need a reason to be confident. I don't mean just going looking back and being like, oh, well, because I'm great and because I've won all these trophies when I was in Little League, so I should therefore be this good. More so, what are you doing on a daily basis um, in order to base that confidence in on? You are what you put into it. So I, would, I never work with my athletes just all of a sudden develop some mental set. It's like you need to be that person and base your confidence on that reality. And so really preparing, there's no substitution for preparing. So let's talk about preparation. One of the best things that you can do when you practice, and I'm talking about practice in a sport, but I'm talking about practice for your job. Again, this is not only mental toughness for, for sports, but I think these apply to any area that you want to perform in. Do you have a specific goal every time you're working on your craft? And it really surprises me that, again, particularly a lot of college athletes or high school athletes that I consult with, it's like I just do what's on the sheet of paper. I just do what the coach tells me. What would you learn to practice today You know, for runners? Well, I ran. Is, do you just put in the mileage, or can you do something where you put into it and say, well, what are you going to work on today? I remember when I was training for a marathon that I had done, it was a long run, and I, I, it was during the winter because you know, we got some snow here, and I had on, I don't know how many layers I had. And I go out, I'm a half mile into it. I think I had a 13-mile run that day, and I had my Under Armour on backwards, and I had the first layer, and I had that darn tag was cutting my throat. felt like a, I mean, that was a bit of an exaggeration. It was nicking me, but... I had all these layers, and it was bothering me. So I'm running, and I'm like, oh, man, this is annoying. And I was like, well, should I go back? And I was like, you know what, sports psychologist, I'm like, why don't you work on some mental toughness? You know, this, this 25K or marathon is going to hurt. So what I had done, I was like, my run today is not only to do the 13 miles, I was like, but I'm going to tolerate this annoying thing. I'm going to run with it for 13 miles and practice letting it go. So can you build things into it? I, I, one of my favorite interventions with my athletes is to keep a training journal and say at the end of every practice, why am I better today because of this workout? What, am I, what did I learn today or what did I develop today? It doesn't have to be new, but why am I a better athlete because I did this workout? What do I want to get out of the next one? And then that's how you build the confidence. Over and over again, that sense of telling yourself in reality what you're doing to improve on a day-to-day -day basis. SMART, just as you may, may have heard this, but SMART goals. When you go to set a goal, how many people set the goal like, oh, I'm going to do my best? You don't, yeah, terrible goal. Yeah, because what the heck does that look like? Well, I'm going to try hard. OK, what, again, we already saw how that was a miserable failure when we say, I'm going to do my best. So what you want to do, SMART stands for specific and measurable. You want to be, be able to see it and measure it so that you know I either did it or I didn't very objectively. Attainable, challenging but realistic. 
Don't set yourself too low because that'll protect your self-esteem. Oh, I achieve all my goals, but you're not going to get anywhere. But you also, how many people set goals way out of their, because even if I don't reach it, at least I've gotten really far, right? Used to set those all the time. How do you feel when you fail at those? Go back to the perfectionistic slide. You feel look terrible. Who wants to fail at their goals all the time? So the best goal, when I say challenging but realistic, is a goal that you can hold yourself accountable to that I will definitely achieve this only if I work really hard at it. Sometimes you have to sit down and be quiet and be honest with yourself because then it's the question about how much effort I want to put into it. But those are the best goals as far as attainable. Um, R is relevant. Make it personal. We get so many goals from our coaches, our teachers, our parents. We do these things for other people. But you won't succeed. And I've had so many athletes come in that want to be the best for their parents or something else. And you will never achieve your best if it's not personally meaningful to you. Another important part of mental toughness, making it personally relevant. And then time limited. All right, when under pressure. The attitude towards pressure is really important. A lot of times athletes will often see this as a threat. And you really don't want to be involved in sport or anything else Like if, if the idea is that you're going to lose something. I'm already entitled to it, and then if I don't do well, something's going to be taken away. But if you can start to look at these, these things, like whether, again, the GRE, my sport, um, a big tournament, it's, it's the opportunity to do something great. Now, when you're really freaking out and nervous about it, it's kind of hard to adapt that attitude, I understand. But spend some time at it and look and say, you know, all great accomplishments have come under adversity. I mean, it wouldn't be great if it wasn't hard. So there's something about that, again, in talking with athletes, too. I'm like, how many athletes hate losing? But isn't it weird that if you would win all the time, you'd hate your sport? Apparently not my six-year-old, because going back, I didn't finish that story. Two days later, two weeks later, he comes running off the field and he goes, what if we won 100 to nothing? I'm like, buddy, that, that wouldn't be any fun. He looked at me like I was the crazy one. He goes, yeah, it would, and ran off. But you know, I mean, if, if you won every time, I mean, the sport would be nothing. It, it's, why would you do it? We get into sport because of how we get pushed and challenged and because the risk of loss is there. So we want to embrace it. That's the whole reason that we're doing it. We're going to lose sometimes. We're going to lose actually a lot of the time. And baseball is a great metaphor for that. I'm like, you can go to the Hall of Fame failing seven out of ten times. It's pretty amazing. Anyway, under pressure, challenge yourself to do something great. And I like to, I got a couple of strategies that I use, but I want to share this one with you. Is that when you get overwhelming and your mind, like when you're under pressure, right, like all those things start to come in. All these distractions, all the things that you have to do. Coach is pulling you aside, and, and you've got 12 things to take care of, and all these responsibilities. It's just too much to do. Like, if you can focus on one thing at a time. So I like to have my athletes before the game or before their performance is to say, what's your job? Take at most three, probably no less than two, two or three behaviors that you can specifically do that you say, if I do these things, it's going to move me, give me the best chance to succeed. So I had a basketball player, for example, and uh, she had just a lot of negative self-talk. She was in these big pressure situations. Um, actually, it was a great story, and I, I swear I'm not making this up because it sounds like a Disney movie. But she, uh, she had a coach that had left, and she was really close to the coach. She went to another school. She, this is the next season. She was really nervous about this game because she was going to play her old coach. And she loved this old coach, but at the same time, she wanted to beat her because she wanted to let her know that she shouldn't have left her team and she wanted to be a great player in that game and really show her, you know, and make her proud, but also kind of get all these emotional dynamics. So she was just really, really stressed out. Lots of pressure in this game. And so this intervention worked really well for us. Is okay, look, what are the three things that you need to do? And if you do these things, that'll give you the best chance to see. She says, well, I need to keep my arms up on defense. She tends to kind of drop them as she gets tired. I need to communicate with my teammates. She was a, a vocal leader, and she never wanted to keep them focused and, and play that leadership role. And she goes, I really need to keep my hustle going. Because when you get tired, we tend to kind of take the edge off. So she's like, if I do those three things, we could play pretty well. So she said that it was probably one of the best things that she was able to do is that when she had all this pressure, she's thinking about her coach, she's thinking about the score, and this and that and the other thing. She did a centering breath. It, it, it lapses in the game. <laughs> and then was able to say, what's my job? What do I need to do? Um, did this with the lacrosse team and stuff too. And they talk about it's just it's really nice because then it lets you forget everything else. Which you know you don't forget everything else, but you're able to really say what I can control and move in that direction. Well, the, the game was, I think they were down by one. She had the ball in her hand for the last shot of the game, made the shot to win. 
you know, everybody runs onto the field, and I'm just like, are you kidding me? I was like, we got to sell this to Disney. <laughs> but it was just exactly like you describe it, against the old coach and everything else. And she really said it was her ability, the, the calming effect of knowing what her job was. So elaborating on it, you've got to identify what your job is. Do you know how to do your job? Because it would be great if, you know, if my job was to guard her. I, can, you know, I don't know how to do that. I am not that type of a player. Um, so do you, do you know this? Do you understand how, what your job is? And then can you? I may know how to do it, but I don't have the physical ability. So before you set yourself up for having a job that you can't really execute, you want to kind of go through that checklist to, again, help build your confidence and really invest in it. And once you get through those three points, maybe the most important question you want to ask yourself, and don't do this too quickly, will I do my job? Very interesting when I've worked with athletes. I'll go through, yeah, okay, I know what my job is. It's these three things. I know how to do it. I can do it. I'm like, will you? And they're like, well, you know, do I need to give this lecture over again? <laughs> and they're like, well, you know, but this is important. Or, but what about this? And what about that? And they lack the commitment. They lack the choice. And that's not going to be effective. And so it's been amazing to me about asking yourself to really slow down and say, can I make that commitment to say, I'm going to commit myself to these points, these three behaviors. And that's where the settling comes in. That's where your focus comes in. And again, if they're under your control, you're going to get the best result. So this is one of my favorite interventions um, for pressure. Positive focus. Maintain a positive focus and effort at all times. I'm going to visit that in a minute, especially after mistakes. I know it's going to be impossible to do this, but as best that you can, keeping that optimism, I think we all kind of know. And again, mentally tough athletes are able to do this to a great degree. Part of the reason that you want to do it, too, though, is especially in a team sport, when you choose a positive attitude and you kind of keep that optimism and that hope alive, you're affecting your teammates. Um, you're building confidence on the team. And then when you're like this, like if I'm playing you, 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 if you see me on the other side of the tennis court and I'm like, what happens to your confidence? Right? If I'm looking like I'm already beat and I'm already negative, not only am I hurting myself, but I'm giving fuel to my opponents. So even if you have to fake it till you make it type thing, you want to be able to act and, and portray that uh, the best you can. I'll go over this quickly because the next point I think is even more important. Can you beat negative thinking? I mean, really beat it. Is there anybody here that doesn't think negatively? Is there anybody here that hasn't thought negatively today? And by that, I don't mean that you're beating yourself up in a depressed state. I just mean a quick doubt fly through your head or a, a negative emotion. That's part of being human. I've actually, in fact, changed the way that I practice with athletes and clients in general where I've given up. I don't believe in positive thinking anymore because if I can't do it, how unfair is it for me to take a depressed person or an athlete who's got you know, real pressure making a million-dollar putt? Then I'll be like, oh, you know, just, just choose these thoughts. This is what's going to help. Well, it would, but you can't beat this negative thinking. So here's my favorite part of the presentation. Follow the story with me. When a turtle gets threatened, what does it do? It goes into its shell. When a cheetah gets threatened, what does it do? It runs. When a porcupine gets threatened, about six of you, I, I, love, I always love that reaction. Get the quills that go out. A uh, chameleon. A skunk. Okay. Why does it do all this stuff? Why does each animal have their thing? Defense. Let's get a little bit more specific. Adaptations. It's actually been evolved as they have their thing for survival. It's their thing for survival. So what do we have as human beings? What's our thing? We dominate the planet, top of the food chain. We're not very strong, not very fast. We have our brains. So let, what about our brains? Higher thinking. Let's get real specific. There's one thing that our brain does for survival. Survival. What's that? Adapt. I don't know exactly what that looks like. We do it every day. When you, when you go to cross the street, what's the first thing that comes through your mind? That's your survival mechanism. Our brain is actually built to worry. So I tell my athletes when they're coming in, I'm like, I'm not going to get you to stop worrying. I can't. No more than I can take a turtle out of its shell or have a skunk decide if it wants to spray me or not if I kick it. It's like, 
we just worry. And again, I'm not talking panic attacks and the extreme phobias and things, but we are, our, our brain is built to, to scan the world for danger constantly, constantly. If I'm here talking, I don't care how interested you, you, know, you are in this presentation or how good you think I'm doing, if a bomb it goes off over there, who's going to still listen to me? I'm going to keep going. I'm going to be giving you all this good stuff. Who's going to pay attention to what I'm talking about? Nobody. <laughs> it's okay. I don't take it personally. You won't be able to. You ever have this experience? You're at a party and you're all talking, you're chatting, but you hear your name, you know, a couple circle, social circles down. You weren't listening for it, but you hear it. And again, not that it's necessarily threatening, but you want to know what they're talking about. <laughs> you, you're feeling me. <laughs> right? We can't help it. Even when you don't know it, it's unconscious. Our brain is always scanning, looking for something that's going to hurt us. It's a survival mechanism. Our brain doesn't care about how well we play soccer or how we're going to do on the GRE. It does to a certain level, and you care. But at an instinctual level, we're built to worry. We are just very, very simple in some ways at, at our core. We approach pleasure and avoid pain. Right? Think of your lives for a second. Whatever makes me feel good, I want more of. I crave it. Anything that I don't like at all, I want to avoid it. Explains almost everything wrong. Psychology professors in the room, right? Explain almost everything that we will ever treat and everything in human beings. We're wired to do this. So my athletes come in, and what do you think you're going to worry the most about? What you care the most about. So again, I start off and let you guys know, if you're worried about the GRE, if you're worried about your at-bats, if you're worried about your, your, your boyfriend or girlfriend, it's because you care. You're normal, and you should worry. But your mind's not your friend. Your mind is your survival mechanism. So we got to start to develop sort of a healthy skepticism of what our mind is actually telling us. I don't know if you guys are as fascinated by this as I am. We're going to do an exercise here. But th this stuff like, really started to change the way I interacted with the world and certainly with my athletes. But we're going to kind of fundamentally look at things differently. We got to remember, your mind has got one job and one job only. And that's to keep you alive. Everything else is secondary to that. You're not a, how many people have their lives threatened every day? Right? Almost none of us. One person said three times in their lifetime. So sometimes you get into that occasion. But most of the time, we've got this taken care of because we're at the top of the food chain. But we have to remember, again, how we're wired. Our mind has one job, and it's to protect us. So our happiness and our performances are always going to be secondary to awareness of these threats. Um, I, I left this dot, dot, dot because I want to figure out with the size of the room. Here's what I'd like you to do. Everybody go like this, and for 45 seconds, pat yourself on the head, and say, I can't pat myself on the head, out loud. After 45 more seconds, I'll say, then think it, and I want you to keep thinking over and over again, I can't pat myself on the head. And I just want you to notice what happens. You can't fail at this. You can't do it wrong. Just want you to notice what happens, OK? So go. I can't pat my head. I can't pat my head. I can't pat my head. Really believe it. I can't pat my head. I can't pat my head. You can't pat your head. And now quietly think it as you keep patting your head. You can switch arms if you're tired. <laughs> now, really think. Maybe close your eyes and really try to believe it. Listen to that voice that nags you, that tells you you can't do things, that worries. And just notice what happens. Keep thinking, I can't pat my head. So, reactions. What'd you think? Put you to sleep? 
I can honestly say that's the first time I've had that reaction, but okay. Any other reaction? I don't, I don't know how to respond to that one. <laughs> I'm sorry? Okay, you, you were aware that you were getting tired. Usually I do this with walking, so it's not quite as exhausting as this exercise was. Um, let me help lead you through. What, what did you think about thinking one thing and doing another? I mean, usually what athletes tell me is that the first reaction is that was weird. They sit down, they laugh, I heard the laughter at the beginning. It, it felt weird, it felt stupid, didn't it? So let's talk about that experience. I, that there's a lot in that experience that's ex actually extremely important to be aware of. Like I said, you can't fail at this. This is just the way things are. If we were able to say I can't do something and then do it, that tells us something about the world we live in. Let's forget for a moment about the content of our thoughts. That's really where we live and where we get stuck. I just want to talk about thoughts as they exist in the world and beha versus behaviors. So if I do something, let's talk about behaviors. If I do something, have I always done it? For example, I'm going to step to the right. Did I step to the right? When we reference that moment in time, have I always stepped to the right? Right? Okay, if I, if I throw this on the floor, which I won't because it's not mine, but if I did, would I have thrown it on the floor? If a billion people saw it, would a billion people say, yes, I threw it on the floor? And in that moment in time, would that have always been done? Right? It sounds kind of silly, but let's say anytime we have a behavior, that's reality. It's always happened. But what about thoughts? I had the thought that I can't walk, but I'm walking. I have the thought I can't pat my head, but I was patting my head. So what does that tell you about your thoughts and the content of your thoughts on at least some occasions? They're not always true. They don't reflect reality. Now, sometimes they do, and oftentimes they do. If I say I'm a male, OK. We can prove that. We won't, but we can prove that. <laughs> Just to thank me later. <laughs> you know, and it can sometimes correlate. But if I have the thought that I'm a female, you know, it's like it, it can sound the same, and we can people can interact with it the same, in, from a level of content, or it, it screws us up. I'm botching that up. Here's a better example. So me, you put me on the roof, and I think I can fly, I can fly, I can fly. I'm never really going to hold on to that thought and jump. But if I have somebody who maybe has delusions, um, who actually will hold on to that thought, what's he or she going to do? They're going to jump. It doesn't matter whether or not we can fly or not. What's going to happen to that person? They're going to go crashing down to the ground. So we relate this to the idea of the content of our thoughts. It really doesn't matter about the outcome. I can win, or I can do this, or I can't. Who knows? Actually, that, that doesn't matter. What matters is what does that thought, what is the function of that thought, what does it make us do? I can believe that I, I, I can fly, and that's gonna make, then I'm going to jump. If I don't believe that I can fly, even though I'm saying it, even though the thought is there, then I won't jump. And isn't that what we're talking about from a level of performance? That's important. What does it drive us to do? So backing it up, notice the disconnect then between thoughts and behaviors, and actually how independent they are. We often think, and again, in the traditional CBT model, that thoughts, if I have a certain thought, it's going to create a certain emotion, and then it'll determine what behavior we have. Well, that can often happen. If I think I suck, I'm going to feel depressed, and I'm not going to play well. Most of my athletes will come in that way. It could start anywhere. I'm not playing well, and therefore, I think I'm no good, and I have depressive feelings. And so it all moves in this direction. But in the actual reality of things, I can think I can't pat my head as I pat my head and feel stupid doing it. Our thoughts, our feelings, and our actions are actually independent. They're not built to be that way. Because if I think, oh my gosh, this is dangerous, my fight or flight response will kick in and I'll want to run away from the threat for all the survival reasons that we talked about. So it's good survival, not good to help me play soccer. So we want to be able to respect that and start to notice when we get thoughts and feelings that interfere with our performance. This is where mental toughness comes from being able to continue to move in that value direction, what's going to be best for me, all the skills that we've talked about, regardless of how I think and feel, rather than engaging in the battle of thinking and feeling. Because if we argue with our negative thoughts all day, what are we not paying attention to? Well, let's say I'm thinking about the positive thoughts, too. I'm a great sports psychologist, or I'm, I'm going to kill this test. What am I not thinking about when I'm taking the GRE? 
you gave me the right answer the first. No, th about five minutes ago. <laughs> when you're taking the GRE, what's the thing you're supposed to think about? The question in front of you. If I'm thinking about how good and how I'm going to kill the test, that's just as bad of a distraction because I'm not thinking about the question. Let me elaborate a little bit more. What was your experience now as I'm talking about it, saying one thing and doing another? Which one is ultimately real? What you're doing, your behaviors, trusting your experience, not trusting your internal experience. The experience of what's going on out here, that's what's critical. If thoughts affected movement, um, I guess you guys got physically tired. Real quick story, I was, I was, when I have my athletes do this, they say, I can't walk, I can't walk. And sometimes they'll start to get like tight butts and they'll start to walk weird and their gait will change. And I said, well, what happened here? And they're like, well, I was actually, I was thinking about how I can't walk and it actually started to affect how I was walking. And they found like, that's kind of scary because I've been walking for 10, 20, 30 years and yet it's starting to interfere with it. And it does let us know the power of belief and how we can kind of create an alternate reality, much like that person jumping off the roof if they believe in these thoughts, even though they're not objectively true. The issue is our attachment to our thoughts, not the presence of them. And that's where the, the, the breathing, the getting focused on the moment, choosing your attention on what you can control, ends up being so important, tying this together. And I think I kind of explained how this experience might help in your performance. So I, we've got 10 more minutes, so I'm going to skip that question to go through this exercise with you. Let me ask you, and you don't have to answer these out loud, but did you ever feel sick or tired and want to stay home but go to work, school, or practice anyway? Gets lots of giggling. Some professors are here, so hold on to that one. Did you ever feel frightened but act confidently? Did you ever think that you can't do it and do it anyway? Did you ever think about stealing something but didn't? Did you ever feel sad but act happy? Did you ever feel angry but act calmly? Again, don't answer these out loud. Did you ever think about cheating on your partner but not do it? Did you ever want to quit school or skip class but go anyway? Did you ever want to yell at somebody but keep quiet? Did you ever dislike a teammate but cooperate with him or her anyway? Did you ever feel like running away from a stressful or awkward situation but stay? If you've had these experiences, what does this show you? I don't think we recognize we get caught up so many times with what we're thinking or what we're feeling and we feel like we have to act in that direction. What we, ha what we haven't given ourselves credit for is that we, we ignore this stuff all the time. Let me ask you another question. If, if you did everything you thought, where would you be right now? <laughs> That's about the best answer. I, I challenge you to, to think about more thoughts than just being in Hawaii. Most people say they'd either be dead or in jail if you did everything you ever thought of. You have a tremendous capacity to let some of these thoughts go. It's just harder when you're built to hook onto the ones that are meant to protect you from a survival standpoint. If you're an athlete and you care about something, losing is going to hurt. So you're going to worry and hold on to all the things that are going to try to get you to not put yourself in that situation. Great for survival, horrible for quality of life. And I think this is the fundamental summary point of, of this whole section here that I'd like you to think of, is that if there's an area of life that you want to perform in and do well and be tough in, you've got to understand that all the fear and all the worry and all the negative emotions are there to protect you from getting hurt. But that should be your number one sign that you are in the exact right spot. Because if you didn't care, you wouldn't worry about it. But the more you care and the more nervous you are, it's actually a very positive sign that you're right where you need to be. Because you care, and it makes your life worth living. And if you want to perform your best in it, just acknowledge all that negative stuff as something that's there to protect you. Let it go to the side and use the skills that we've talked about. You can't get rid of these negative thoughts and feelings, but let them be there and then make the mental toughness choices anyway. Which really gets to the idea of commitment. I don't talk about being motivated anymore. You know, oh, I need motivation. You give a motivational talk. I'm like, nope, I don't do that because motivation is short-lived. I will take a team of athletes, a team of people in the workplace who are committed long before I take anybody that's motivated. And here's why. 
so I'm going to ask somebody to pick. Somebody tell me something about a decision that maybe it's hard to commit to, whether it be exercise, or quit smoking, or going on a diet. We've all got them, but will somebody be willing? Studying. Studying. So what reasons do you have to study? To get a good grade, to pass. Other reasons to study? To learn. To build your self-confidence. Other reasons to study? To get a job, college, set yourself up. Good. What reasons do you have not to study? Wow, we got a lot more of those. I can't keep up. Lazy, boring, don't feel like it. <laughs> not motivated, don't feel like it. Sleep is a good one. Work. Work in the sense of competing, like I, got, I can make money or I can study a book. There's a billion other things that you could do that are more enjoyable. I could be watching TV. I could, I could exercise. I mean, there's, you know, if any time I make a choice in one direction, there are a, a thousand things that I'm not choosing to do. So let me ask you, how many times do you try to talk yourself into it, right? What's the point? There is no point. There's, there's a billion reasons to do something and a billion reasons not to. So I try to get my app and say, forget about it. Forget about this argument that goes on. And you, this works in, in clinical disorders, too. I mean, like, you get somebody who's trying to rehabilitate from substance abuse. They're like, well, I'm going to do it for my family. I'm going to do it for my kids. Well, you know what? You had a family and kids when you were using drugs any, then. That doesn't change. So don't, don't falsely latch yourself onto something for motivation. What you need to do is go back to the idea of the values and the commitment and recognize that there are reasons to do it or not do it, but neither one of them is going to be the thing to depend on. So I will take a committed athlete, somebody who's going to be willing to do things because it's important to them, regardless of what they're going to think and feel. And again, I think this is critical to mental toughness. So good timing here. We've got about six more minutes, so this is the last slide that I have. You don't have to say this out loud, but what I'd like to ask you to do is, as a result of this workshop, what are one or two things now, based on your retirement dinner that we did earlier? There's a lot of information, but if you would just right now take and pick one or two things that you're going to start to do differently. This isn't meant to be a motivational speech. <laughs> I want you to make a behavior commitment to yourself and say, what am I going to do differently so that I could be that person at that retirement dinner at the end of the season that I want to be? I want you to be realistic and think about what barriers are going to be to that. Maybe go back to these reasons that we were talking about. They're going to show up. For the long distance runners that were over here and talking, this we didn't really get a lot into it, but it's the idea of this willingness. What am I going to be willing to feel? What am I going to be willing to suffer in order to achieve my goal, my legacy? And how will you get over them? Again, lots of tangents that we could go on, whether it be mindfulness training, whether it be getting a coach or social support, lots of different ways. But if you know a barrier is there, plan. Don't think, well, I'll just deal with it when it happens. Our mind has a way of hooking us. And I'm going to challenge you to get an accountability partner. If you don't have one, just turn to the person next to you, switch your numbers. <laughs> but give yourself a deadline. Give yourself three, four weeks. Don't, I wouldn't go too long for that, you know, longer than that for the first check-in. I don't see anybody switching numbers, but okay. You get email, maybe people are texting. But I really encourage you to make the commitment and share this with somebody because that public accountability and being able to report to somebody is a nice way to kind of get this behavior change started. Um, let them know what you want to do, specifically that SMART goal, how am I going to do it? And then in two, three, four weeks, check in with each other and see what type of difference that you're making, see if you can build on that. And good. So I got some contact info up there if anybody's interested in getting in contact, and we have five minutes for questions. I'm glad I didn't leave a whole lot of time for that. Thank you. <laughs> Um, how much of your breathing is affected by stress? Is that the question? Yeah. 
so the question is, as sports psychologists, when people are, are running out of breath, is it, is it psychological or physical? Um, and, and what do I see? Um, that is such a general symptom, it's really, I, I don't know that I can necessarily address it because there are, I mean, you're gonna run out of breath if you're just giving effort. Um, so there's that aspect of it. Then some people do have asthma and how do you deal with the asthma or work through that. Um, but there certainly is a component that when your fight or flight response goes, goes off because you're of the mental aspects of you're nervous and if you're hyper intense, like let's say you wanna shoot a free throw, and, you know, you might have some heavy breathing because of the physiological aspect, but there's also a component of it of nervousness. Um, so it, it's almost always a combination. Um, I guess what I would say is that, and this may not directly answer your question, but something that I think is a good point to bring up, is that a lot of times athletes will say, well, teach me to relax, teach me to relax. Well, maybe you don't always want to relax. Sometimes you want to stay intense but focus. I'm not going to teach a defensive lineman to relax, but he might use the breath, like I said, to then focus on, on kill. <laughs> Or, or effort or power. So you want to be able to choose your intensity to match your, your job description. Tiger Woods is going to need a different level of intensity than a defensive lineman. Both of them may use breathing, but it's a matter to match up their intensity to, to what they want to accomplish. Um, and I, like most things I said at the beginning, how much of your game is mental and physical? It's 100% of both. So it would be, I think, more to the individual situation that I could answer that better. Sorry. But I appreciate the question. Does anybody else have one? So to summarize the question so everybody can hear, um, he's looking at the overlap, I guess, of the mental toughness, how it fits in with introversion and extroversion, personality types, and then what I would also call achievement orientation, doing it for yourself versus doing it for others, and how do they all mix. Quite a complicated aspect. I, I personally, and some people like to get into profiling and, and tendencies, I really like to avoid that just because of my orientation, because I see every athlete that I work with as an individual, with their own set of history and goals and, and nuances. So I think those literatures are, of course, very important, um, but I really hesitate to kind of start to profile or make people think this is the box that you fit into. With that being said, um, I have athletes that are very introverted and extroverted. I don't see too much of a correlation one way or the other. And then as far as the achievement orientation aspect of it, um, I think that the more you do it for other people, actually the more often I'll see you in my office because that's not the right orientation. If you're doing it for other people's approval versus your own intrinsic motivation, you're not gonna do as well because you don't have control over that. And you know, my parents' approval has nothing to do with me hitting my free throw. And so that's gonna end up often be a distraction. And sometimes it can get actually pretty severe. When I, again, sometimes I'll see athletes come in, and again, this is kind of a note for the parents out there. You, know, you wanna keep your you want to let your kids know that you love them regardless of their outcome. I mean, again, I didn't do a good job of that on my five-year-old's you know, uh, game. But they were going to pick that up. They know what makes you happy and what doesn't. And what you want to instill in, in kids and in yourself is to say, you know, it's just a sport, and it can be very important, but it's not a measure of your worth, and you don't, you don't achieve love through this accomplishment. But the whole world doesn't tell us that. As parents, we want to teach our kids that. As coaches, as volunteer coaches, we want to get that across. We want to reinforce the effort. And so I want their achievement motivation to be based on, look, I want to have fun. I want to get good. I want to get in shape. I want to do these things for me. And the healthiest athletes, the most successful athletes, are really grounded in that. Um, I've seen a number of athletes. I'll, I'll tell one quick story. A, a girl came in, really stressed out about tennis, really flipping out making mistakes, 
dad was in there. It turns out she was like, look, I just want to make my dad proud, and I don't think he's proud, and if I make a mistake, this is, and I'm like, well, well, dad's out there. Can we just bring him in? And I'm like, oh, gosh, you know, this could go bad. But I brought him in. He had no idea that she was that stressed out. She's like, I just want to know that you're proud of me. And he's like, honey, he's like, I'm proud of you. He's like, I don't care about tennis. I mean, I care, but <laughs> he's like, you know, if you want to quit tomorrow, that'd be fine. And she was relieved, and she went out and won state championships. And everything had to do with she was so distracted about that. And I've got more stories about literal clinical depression. One basketball player in high school, it really, it brought tears to my eyes, where she sat there and said, Dad's not going to love me if I don't do well. And she, you know how hard it is to hit a free throw with that? You know, if I miss this, my dad's not going to love me. And he stood there, and he's like, oh, she knows that I love her. I'm like, dude, she doesn't. I'm like, you, you know, the intervention there was like, you got to stop talking about basketball. He was her coach, too. I was like, I don't want to hear you guys talking about it over dinner. And you guys need to go on a date once a week and not t about something else. You need to build your relationship around something other than this. And he was a hard switch to make because he didn't really buy into it. But she was clinically depressed as a result of this. And so by being able to switch it over and get dad out of it and they developed a relationship otherwise, then she was able to go back playing, having fun with basketball and, and actually doing well. So that achievement orientation can, can be a really big deal. Long answer to a short question. I know we're out of time. Dr. Connors, thank you so much for coming. Please. <laughs> Have a great end of the semester. Like it? Really great. Good, thanks. <laughs>